Asking questions is not a sin. It is good to ask, discuss and understand so that we know God's heart and what we believe. In part 1 of this series, we discuss common questions that were asked regarding Christian walk and marriage, including questions on finding a life partner, divorce, idols and submission to authority. Next week we'll answer questions on lifestyle, theology and the local church. Happy listening. You know in our youth camp uh, that we had some time back, we had a few sessions where we were answering questions that young people were asking. And suddenly a light bulb went saying maybe adults also have questions. <laughs> maybe, you know, there are maybe many other people in church who also have questions. So why don't we just do something like this? Why don't we let people ask their questions and take some time on Sunday morning uh, to answer those questions to the best that we can. And so we sent out an email saying, you know, those of you who want to ask questions, please ask questions. We'll do our best to answer them. And so uh, several people responded. Uh, we collected all the questions, put them all together. And uh, then I added in some more questions which I thought, uh, which people have asked over time that, that seem to be a common question that keeps coming up over and over again. Put them all together and then we kind of broadly categorized them into five main areas. So there was questions about the Christian walk. Uh, there were questions about marriage. There, there were questions about lifestyle. Like, is it okay to have tattoos? Okay to go to the pub? You know, <laughs> all those kinds of questions. Is okay to watch movies? About our lifestyle. Um, we had questions on theology. Some very, very spiritual questions. You know, about dreams and so on. And, and then we had questions about church. So... Broadly categorize these questions and so we said let's try and cover these questions over two Sundays today and next Sunday and in case we are not unable to cover them, uh, we had some emails come in like just last couple of days with some more questions so I don't know. Uh, in case we're not able to cover them in two Sundays, we'll probably do it once again on the last Sunday of the month. This morning, we're going to cover the questions that, have, that came in on, these, on the first two areas, on Christian walk and marriage. So all I'm going to do is, is mention the question and then share the answer. And uh, in doing that, we'll try to, in providing the answer, we want to be very clear. Uh, we, we obviously have to be very brief. We have only limited time. And I'm going to try to be direct and scriptural, just come, come off from the Bible, speak what the Word of God says on this subject. Uh, on topics where the scriptures are silent, of course, there are these situations the Bible doesn't necessarily address. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to, uh, try to address the, bring the answer from an understanding of the heart of God. This is God's heart. This is who God is. Therefore, this would be the right answer to that question. And also, uh, some of them are very practical, so we're going to bring it out from a very practical standpoint. So... Uh, in some cases, I'll be sharing my observations. I will be sharing my own personal opinion. In that case, I'll say, you know, this is my opinion. You're most welcome to have your own. And, uh, you know, don't throw stones at me because <laughs> you're free to have your own opinion in those situations. So let's talk about questions on the Christian walk. Are you ready? And for those who are watching, some of these questions are very specific to our Indian culture and Indian context. Now, there are about people from 140 odd countries listening or watching and using our website. So not all, this, not all this will apply to every context. So we are speaking purely from our local context here. And, and, and please bear that in mind. Question number one. What is an idol? How do I know whether there are idols in my life? How do I get rid of them? So anything that takes God's place in our lives is an idol. So it could be a material object. It could be a person, Shah Rukh Khan or something like that. You know? <laughs> or it could be an emotion, you know, a drive, a desire. You know, I want to become this, I want to become that. Anything, it could be a mental object, it could be a person, it could be an emotion that takes the place of God in my life is an idol. Um, the Bible, for instance, in Ephesians 5 says, 5.5 5 calls covetousness as idolatry. Covetousness simply means an uncontrolled desire, passion. That is idolatry, the Bible says in Ephesians 5 and 5. Now, how do I know that there are idols in my life? Just two important things here. One is an honest self-examination. I just, hey, see if there are areas in your life where God is taking second place or third place and something else is becoming more important, then that's becoming an idol in, in my life. 
So in honor self-examination, the Bible does tell us, for instance, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, uh, examine yourselves to see if you are still in the faith. Examine yourself. Check, your, check up on yourself. 1 Corinthians 11 says, if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. So there is a place when you need to look into your own heart and say, are there idols in my life? Is God always first in my life? Is, you know, is my profession more important to me than God? Is my money more important to me than God? Is a certain relationship more important to me than God? And that's becoming an idol. Secondly, I need to ask the Lord, saying, God, you search my heart and you expose if there's anything wicked in me. That's how the psalmist prayed in Psalm 139, verses 23, 24. He said, oh Lord, search my heart. Know me. Try me. See if there's any wicked way in me. Then you lead me in the paths that's right. So, Search, ask the Lord to search and he'll put his finger on certain areas and then you know, I need to change. And he might do that by his spirit, he might do that through his word, he might do that through the Sunday morning sermon like this morning. Or, or he might do so many ways, he put his finger, look, something there, it's not right. And he can know it, God is doing it. That he's, he's telling you something's not right and then you allow him to correct. So how do I, what is the process of getting rid of idols? The process of getting rid of idols is simply to reestablish God's dominion, God's superiority, God's uh, primary position in your life. You're just reestablishing that, saying, God, come and be. Uh, take your rightful place in my life. So how do we do this? We do this by worship. You begin to worship him. You begin to say, God, I'm putting you first in my life. I'm putting you first in this area of my life. I'm putting you first in that area of my life. You by worship. And secondly, it's just by plain, simple obedience. Do what God says. Just obey. Obedience is our way of saying, there will be nothing else in my life but you. No one else or nothing else is going to become an idol. Question number two. When God says he will give you wisdom and knowledge, do you go out and look for it, say read books or through any other means? Or is it done in a supernatural way through situations or experiences that God takes us through? In other words, how do you get wisdom? Is it only supernatural? By what means? Now, the Bible does say that now, what is wisdom? Wisdom, first of all, is the ability to use knowledge. You can acquire knowledge, acquire information, that's important. But the ability to use that knowledge to solve a problem, to come up with a creative idea, a brand new strategy, how the timing of when to enter a certain market or whatever, that takes wisdom. You need wisdom and knowledge. And the Bible does tell us in Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6 that both wisdom and knowledge come from God. He gives us wisdom. He gives us knowledge. There are many ways that you and I can acquire wisdom in our lives. First, of course, is a supernatural way, which is by His Word and by His Spirit. God gives us wisdom. The entrance of His Word bring light. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of wisdom. He's a spirit of knowledge in Isaiah 11, verse 2. We can also grow in wisdom through our experience over time. As you experience things in life and you process it in the light of God's word, it brings wisdom to you. We can also increase in wisdom by observing, reading and learning from other people's experiences. And that's a great way. L look at their lives. What, have, what has God done in their life? You know, how can I avoid some of the, their same mistakes? It helps you learn a lot. And fourthly, to the counsel of wise people who speak into your life. So my answer to that question is simply, through all means, supernatural and natural. We must grow in wisdom. Question number three. It's about overcoming fear. I am basically a shy person and at times a fear of man. This keeps me from interacting with people. Does the Bible speak about this? How can I get rid of these fears? Yes, the Bible does speak about this. Proverbs 29 verse 25. The Bible says, The fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. The fear of man. When I'm afraid of people, it actually cripples me. It puts me in a prison. The fear of man. Being afraid of people. Now, fear can have two origins or two sources. Fear could, first of all, fear is not normal. God didn't design us to be fearful. Fear uh, uh, is the opposite of faith. It attracts the wrong things into our lives. And fear incapacitates us many times. The source of fear could be twofold. One, it just could be our own wrong thinking. Right? It has to do with our thinking. Maybe we are having wrong ideas, misconceptions. Sometimes it's due to poor self-image. Sometimes it's, it's due to a trauma. You know, the first time you jumped into the pool, the water was so cold, it gave you a cold shock. 
So you don't want to jump into the pool. You know, you're on the edge. You know, don't want to jump. Just get over it. You know. So it could be a, a bad experience or and things like that. So it has to do with our mind. But sometimes fear could also be demonic. It's a spirit. There are devils or demons that cause fear. And so you need to deal with that in, in order to overcome certain kinds of fear in our lives. So depending on the nature of fear that, that a person is encountering, sometimes it's a combination of the two. Uh, how, this is how we go about overcoming fear. First of all, we need to receive emotional healing from God for any trauma, any bad experience of the past. God heals us emotionally through his word and by his spirit. And we also need to resist any demonic activity. If this, if this fear is caused because of evil spirits, the fear uh, driven, motivated and inspired by evil spirits, resist that. Don't give it any place in your life. Secondly, we need to renew our mind, change our thinking, create a positive self-image of yourself by believing that you are who God says you are. That uh, your identity is who you are in Christ. Repaint pictures of yourself. Create a positive self-image. Dislodge those negative thoughts and, and misconceptions and wrong ideas of what people think about you. And number three is have faith. Faith must replace fear. Amen? The word of God says, and you know this, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Not, not, he's not given us the spirit of it. This has nothing to do in my life. But it's given me power, love, and a sound mind. So I don't tolerate fear. You and I don't tolerate fear in our lives. It has no, no place in us. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Here's a simple question. Trust in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your hearts. Pastor, could you explain this? So I suppose you say, man... How could God tell me? Give me the desires of my heart. Man. <laughs> Psalm 37 verse 4 is what I think this person is quoting. The Bible says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Or a parallel scripture in the New Testament, John 15 and verse 7, Jesus said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you will. It will be done for you. It's like, God, I mean, are you sure? You didn't make any... Any mistake there, you know, <laughs> in giving us that kind of a promise. And I, and I believe that's an indication of the kind of life and the kind of walk God wants us to have with him. He says, I want you to be in a place where you delight in me. All your emotions, all your passions, all your desires are centered around me. And when you're in that place, whatever your heart desires, I'll give you. You abide in me, my words abide in you. You ask whatever you want. So the point is, is when you and I are in that place, we're not going to ask for anything that's contrary to the heart of God. Amen? We're not going to ask for anything that's just to satisfy our own fleshly desires. And I believe that's why God says, you know, you ask whatever you will. It will be done. But this opens up this beautiful place where you and I can live, where we're delighting ourselves in God so much that whatever we ask, says, I'll do it for you. We need to move into that kind of a place. Amen? Question number five. This definitely is from a young person. He says, are children always under the worst that says, obey your father and mother? When you have plans for your future and your parents have another set of plans, are you disobeying them when you follow through with your plans? Is one guilty as long as the plans are not against God's will? Now, here's how I understand the word of God. Ephesians 6 verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Honor your father and mother. So there is a time of obedience, there's a place of obedience, and there's a place of honor. You know, as long as you and I are, are little kids and we are uh, uh, those of us who, uh, as long as there are kids and you're sitting and <laughs> you're taken care of by your parents the place of obedience is, is important you obey you do whatever they say but at some point you're going to transition out of that you're going to be standing on your own feet and your parents are not going to be dictating to you what to do what not to do. you're now a grown up person you are uh, working you're, 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 you're on your own feet 
at that time you're, 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 you are responsible for your own decisions. You are accountable to God like the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10. Each one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of what we've done. I mean, I can't say, God, I did this because my father told me. God said, but I told you to do this. Right? So I'm going to be accountable to God for what I did with my life. There is a time and a place when responsibility shifts from my parents towards me. I'm responsible now. And I'm going to account, give an account to God for myself. So in this place, when I'm an adult, I've grown up, now I'm standing on my own feet. I move from just obedience to a place of honoring my parents. Where now... I make my decisions. I am responsible for my decisions. But as far as my parents are concerned, I honor them. I respect them. I listen to what they have to say. I take their input. I receive their counsel. I receive their guidance. But ultimately, the decision is mine. And I take what they say. I may take what other people say. But I go before God and say, God, what do you say? And I'm accountable to God for obedience to him. Amen? When I was a child... Obedience is what matters. When I grow up as an adult, honor matters. I continue to honor my parents. I may not necessarily obey them in everything they say, but I continue to honor and respect them. Um, the same thing is about civil authority. You know, the Bible does tell us to obey civil authority. For example, Romans 13, 1 to 5, it says, Obey those who have authority over you, the governors, the rulers, those who come to pay your taxes and so on. But there, is a, there are instances when people be disobey. For example, in Acts chapter 4, I was 18 through, 18 through 20 when the Sanhedrin got Peter and John. They said, you, we, we're commanding you not to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. Peter responds and says, you tell us whether it's more important to obey God rather than you. All right? So there's a time and a place when our obedience to God supersedes and may lead us into disobedience towards civil government. Now, we're not encouraging that all the time. You better obey your traffic lights and pay your taxes and stay on the right side of the road, on the left side of the road. Amen? But when it comes to obeying God, that takes priority in our lives over human authority. The next question is kind of related to this. It says, is it necessary for young people to respect and obey people in authority within the church? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who are the people in authority within and outside the church? So the answer is yes. God has commanded us to obey um, uh, our people, he's placed in authority in various spheres of life. For example, we just talked about children to their parents, a wife to a husband, an employee to his or her boss or supervisor, a citizen to civil authority, and believers to spiritual leaders, elders in the church. So in the church, there we have different levels of leadership. If you're part of a volunteer team, there's a volunteer leader there. He's not there by accident. He's been appointed a certain place by the leadership of the church. Uh, if you're part of a ministry, there's a pastor, a ministry leader appointed for that. You walk in submission to him or her. Uh, and there are pastors in the congregation. And so there are different levels of leadership in the church. And we submit, we walk under that leadership. Not because we're afraid of man, but because we want to honor God. Amen? And we want to flow together in unity so we can further the purposes of God's kingdom. Let's move to talking about marriage. Question number one on marriage. Is it wrong to want a beautiful wife or a handsome husband without neglecting the fact that the person has a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do we have the freedom to choose who we want to get married to or do we wait for God to bring the right person? Could you share the examples from the Bible as well as scriptures on this? So, here's my opinion on it. I believe that once you've got your priorities in place, meaning God is first in your life, you're doing the will of God, you're walking with God, then any other criteria is up to you. Handsome husband, beautiful wife, that's up to you. You make your choice, you decide in your own mind what kind of a person you want. As long as you've got your priorities in place, right? Uh, that's absolutely not a problem. But we must, of course, guard our heart from lusting after outward appearance, whether it's in a male or in a female. Guard your heart from making that such an important thing. The Bible makes it so clear in Proverbs 31 and verse 30. It says, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. So keep that in mind before you may give... Um, 
outward appearance a very high priority. Now, about finding the right person for your life, I believe it's a combination of the two. That means God will orchestrate things in your life and in the life of the other person that is, is intended for you. So Psalm 32 verse 8 says, God says, I will lead you, I will teach you the way you should go, I will guide you with my eye. You know the scripture in Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So God is orchestrating things in your life and other people's lives. He's orchestrating, he's putting things up, he's setting up things. But at the same time, I believe it's our responsibility to do some seeking, some searching. We must also actively pursue finding uh, who the person, the right person would be for your life. When you, you do actively search, uh, just like Abraham's servant. You know, Abraham told the servant, you know, go find a bride for my son Isaac. And imagine if he had gone under a tent and sat down there in 21 day fast, you know. God send me. No, he had to get up on his camel. He had to make the journey to that land and finally he reached there and he said, okay, God, now what next? And he said, okay, there's a well. So he said, okay, God, you know, this is, a, this is what I can understand. So God, please, whoever comes there, I'm going to ask her to give me some water. And if she says, I'll give you water and your camels, I'll take it as a sign. And God set the whole thing up. Now imagine if he was praying in his tent and Rebecca was there. I mean, he would have missed the whole thing. <laughs> Probably have to go in another 21 day fast, you know. The point I want to make is God is orchestrating things, but you and I need to be moving. You and I need to actively search. We need to be in the right place at the right time so that when God sets things up, we are there. Amen? So uh, it, it is, it's a combination of the two. Proverbs 18, 22 says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So if you've got to find, you must seek seek and you will find so do something about it proverbs 19 14 houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers but a prudent wife is from the lord it's the lord who provides a prudent wife so he's going to do his part but you and i need to do our part of searching and seeking now uh, first corinthians 7 verses 36 to 38 in the message bible brings out this so very clearly on the fact that we have a choice in this whole thing Listen to what it says in the Message Bible. It's really funny. It puts it in our English. It says this. But if a man has a woman friend to whom he is loyal, but never intended to marry, as some of you people at APC are. No, no that's not there, right? <laughs> Having decided to serve God as a single, and then changes his mind, deciding he should marry her, he should go ahead and marry it's no sin. It's not even a step down from celibacy as some say. On the other hand, if a man is comfortable in his decision for a single life and service to God, and it's entirely his own conviction and not imposed on him by others, he ought to stick with it. Marriage is spiritually and morally right and not inferior to singleness in any way. Although as I indicated earlier, because of the times we live in, I do have pastoral reasons for encouraging singleness so he's basically saying you make up your mind and act on it right that's it question number two on marriage do i as a believer only have to marry a believer what if my parents don't understand the answer to this question is yes you as a believer as believers you are ought to marry only a believer the bible is clear and 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, and it's not referring only to marriage, but we apply it also in the context of marriage, applies to any other uh, uh, area of life. It tells us not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So it's very clear. Our aim is the third chapter, the third verse says, can two walk together unless they are in agreement. You need to be in agreement, which includes spiritual agreement and alignment if you're going to be able to walk together. So the answer is yes. As a believer, you need to be married only to a believer. Is that clear? No doubts? All right. Now, here's, here are my observations. I'm just giving you my observations. Here's what I've seen happen in our church, and I'm speaking specifically of APC Bangalore, across our five locations, what I've observed in the last 12, 12 or so years. As far as marriage is concerned, and I'm, I'm sharing this because I want to bring to our attention an area of need in our life, in us as a church family, which we must actively seek 
to address plus an area where we must understand the heart of God superseding just our theology. I see three categories. I've seen and observed three categories, right? The first category is young men and women who come from strong traditional Christian families or young men and women who come from non-Christian families. Many of them are here. Now, when they go back and tell their parents, I must only marry a believer, it's not easy at all. Because, you know, even traditional Christian parents say, are looking for how tall is he, what's his skin complexion, what's his degree, how much is he earning. That's the criteria. Nowhere in that list is, is he born again? Because that concept is not even there. They're all thinking about, you know, what does my family say? What does my community say? Traditional Christian families. Or it, the same similar challenges from a non-Christian family. Same thing, whether you're a traditional Christian family or a non-Christian family, these young people, when they go back to their families and say, I want to marry a believer, they face the same problems. What I've observed is that in many cases, when these young men or women are independent, that means they, both of them, are, these young people are working, they have their own job, they're not dependent on their parents, they're living by themselves, etc., etc. Uh, the process is a little easier. The parents, uh, there's a struggle, there's all this tension, all that. But eventually they yield, they say, okay, we'll give into it. And so uh, uh, they, these young men and women have taken their stand, they've worked through the process, they get married to believers, and that is highly commendable, and we celebrate that. But one thing I always make a point to tell these young people is, is see, in this whole process, whatever you do, yes, you have to marry a believer, but make sure you honor your parents. Honor their sentiments. Honor their culture. That means if they say, I want you to get married in a certain church building, say, okay. I mean, at the end of it, you're going to get married, man. It's only an hour and a half, you know. Or in some cases, three hours, but that's okay. (laughs) It's okay. Or if they say, you know, we want to have the service in a certain way, it's okay. I mean, honor, after all, they've invested 23 years uh, into your life to bring you where you are. As long as you don't compromise on the fact that they have given you permission to marry a believer, honor them for just for that, that particular service, that event that for them is very important. Honor that, honor their sentiments, honor their feelings, but you're not compromising the obedience of God. So that's category one. Category two is rather unfortunate, and it's happened in our own locations. And this has primarily to do with young ladies who come from non Christian backgrounds. They come, they're part of the church. And uh, uh, they are independent or at least they are ready to obey God by saying, I want to marry a believer. One particular young lady I worked with, I think it was like two, three years. She was serving here in church very faithfully. Only person in her own family who who believed in the Lord Jesus. And, And she said, I want to marry a believer. Help. Help find somebody who can marry me, who is willing to marry me. So she put up her profile on, our Christ, on Christian websites, all that, and spread the word around, people prayed. But you know, after waiting two or three years, she got tired. I believe it's our fault. While we have our theology that you should marry a believer, we're not doing something to fulfill that. So what did she do in the end? After all that waiting, she was serving in this church, with this very location, so faithfully. She finally went to her family and said, you know, just find somebody for me. And obviously they found a non-Christian. She got married. Another couple from our, another location. Um, the mother and the daughter were the only two people from the family who became believers. And they've been just young believers, only for two years. But the daughter was of marriageable age, meaning she, she's ready to get married. And they're just new believers, just like two years in the Lord. And they, they're part of our church. So mother came, said, you know, here's my daughter. She's ready. We want to get married in six months. Can you do something? Like me, do something. <laughs> what to do? I mean, which young man can I go and say, hey, come, get mad at you? <laughs> of course, our young men are so spiritual. They say, how long have you been a believer? Two years, two years. No, I want somebody for five years. You know? <laughs> uh, you know, but that's, that's reality. And ultimately, what happened in that case? The mother said, you know, I've gone to the past. I've told my situation. They've prayed, okay, but six months, she's going to get married. And if we don't provide a believing husband for her, 
the family is going to do their part. So eventually what happened? She got married to an unbeliever. The mother is still coming to our church, but the daughter is with the husband. Okay? So that's the second category which I want to present to you and me saying, look, if we say we are going to win Hindus and non-Christians for Christ, we also be better be prepared to serve them in this area. That means our young men better be prepared to marry some ladies who come from non-Christian backgrounds. And our young ladies better be prepared to marry some young men who come from non-Christian backgrounds. Amen? These are real, real life problems. So you and I have been there. You don't know what they're going through. The last case is even more difficult. And it's primarily seen in young ladies who are not working. They finish their education, but they're at home. They're not independent. They, they, they can't go out. They're totally dependent on the parents. And uh, I know the testimony, so testimony, some of you might be sitting here. And... Uh, the lady, young lady, is in a situation where she can't do anything. Whether it's a traditional Christian family who insists that she has to get married to somebody from this background, this language, this thing, this thing, this thing, and no qualification of being a believer. She can't do anything. She can express saying, I want to marry a believer, but for them, parents and family, that's not important at all. But she has no choice. Unless you're not willing to take her and keep her in our house and get her married. You know? Or a totally Hindu family, but the lady is a believer, but she has no option just to stand there. She's not working. She's not on her feet. She can't take a stand, meaning even if she does say, she can express, I want to be a married believer. For them, what is a believer? No. And what has happened? They eventually get married to non-Christians, whoever the family finds for them. In some cases, and I know at least two, where after years of struggle and painful journey, the husband gets saved. Through the testimony of the wife, like what the Bible talks about, 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. Through her testimony, through her life, the husband comes to the Lord. And then it's a wonderful thing to see. But it doesn't happen in all the cases. So in this third category, I want to tell you and me, we must know the heart of God. That God doesn't stop loving that lady just because she was forced into a marriage against, because there was no option. You and I never did anything to help. God still loves the person. Is it clear? So don't judge that person just because she gets married to an unbeliever because you, hey, there's no choice. I am not saying you and I should get married to non-Christians or unbelievers. What I am saying is these are the situations in life and there are probably more complex situations than what I've talked about this morning. You and I must go by the heart of God. What is God's heart for that person? Right? As long as you and I have the liberty and, and, our, and we must take our stand, obey God, but understand there are other real life scenarios where know the heart of God. Third question. If a believer is in a relationship, whoa. if a believer is in a relationship with a non-believer, is it fine to continue that relationship? As per my understanding, everyone is a son or a daughter of God and it's unfortunate that one of the person is born in an unbelieving family. But what if there's hope of that person, if that person will come to Christ going forward? Not because of us, but Christ. We don't change people, God does. And there are two scriptures quoted along with that. Here's the response. You know, 2 Corinthians 6.14 applies to us before marriage. That means if you're in a relationship with a person who's not a believer, you're not married yet, then you have one of two choices. One, obey God, come out of that relationship. Or two, be prepared to wait, perhaps till eternity, <laughs> till that person becomes a believer. Then get married. The second option, there's no guarantee. Yes, God will work in that person's life. You can bring them to church and so on. But it, that person has to make the decision. Nobody can force it on that person. So there's no guarantee. Right? Now, 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 15 applies to some, a relationship where a person is already married. Let's say two people are married and then one of them come to the Lord and they become a believer. So what do you do now? You continue in the marriage. Just because your husband is not a believer, your spouse is not a believer, you don't give, come out of it. No, you have to continue. And stay in it. That's where 1 Corinthians 7, 12 to 15 applies. Last two questions. Number four. My question is regarding marriage. If a person comes to Christ from another faith and is living in Christ faithfully in spite of many issues like against a family, if or she comes from a non-Christian background, now it is a time for marriage. What should they do? Who will help them kindly pray and help with practical guidance? This is exactly what I've been talking about in the second and third categories. Um, the, the young man who sent this question, he's serving very faithfully here in church. He's been 
at least two years, you've been very faithful serving here. Um, and uh, this is it. He's the only believer in his family. Who's ready to marry him? We'll take your profiles after this. No. <laughs> now, what do we do? How do we help? All right? He's sincere. He wants to, you know. You know. Now, in this particular person's case, nice thing is this. He shared it, his, his, his need with some of uh, uh, the elderly families here, and they've connected him with another um, family, some, I mean, pastor somewhere else. I did the referral check this week, and uh, maybe it'll work out, but what if it doesn't? What if it doesn't? If it works out, it's great, you know? So I think this is an important need that we, as, as part of our member care, and we discussed this last Sunday, it's a very important part of our member care. We need to address these things, especially if we say we're going to win our city for Jesus. We're going to have people coming in from non-Christian families. How do we help them in the area of marriage? Here are some thoughts I want to just put across here. You know, elders in the church, you can help by connecting with other families, churches, pastors, and so on. Number two, uh, I always encourage people to make use of Christian matrimonial sites. And number three, uh, registered marriage bureau. Our church doesn't have a marriage bureau yet, but we spoke about it, thinking of getting something together last Sunday. Um, other churches do have, and put your profiles in there uh, with other ch- uh, uh, marriage bureaus, and stay open. See how God is going to bring this to pass. Last question. Is divorce an option? My husband is a womanizer, flirts with other women, etc., and I've confronted him, and he has accepted this, but is unwilling to change. Bring him here. <laughs> Now, now, God does not approve of divorce. Malachi 2.15, God says, I hate divorce, right? So marriage is for a lifetime through the ups and downs, the valleys and the hills. Marriage is for a lifetime. Every marriage will face its struggles, but we must be committed to working it through until death do us part. So divorce is not an option. In any case. And even if there is moral failure, we try to work it out. We try to see the, uh, receive God's grace and strength to bring um, things uh, become better. I remember just about a year ago, a young lady came. She was uh, probably, she just became a believer, young believer. She came. She said, you know, this is my husband. Yeah, openly, he's out with other women. This, this is, what do I do? And she was totally broken. And we prayed. Just, she came with me only twice. We prayed, pointed her to the counselors and, um, and so on. A year later, she messaged me saying, now everything is good. Things have been restored. The same person who sent this question here, as soon as I got this question, I replied saying, okay, don't give up. Bring your husband to our council. They, she, she, she brought, the husband was willing. They brought her to a Christmas council. They worked with him. Today, both of them are in church. So the marriage is saved. So don't give up. Uh, even, you know, things are so bad. Uh, so divorce is not an option. We've got to try to work it out. But there are cases where the Bible does say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, divorce is permitted. One, in the case of unfaithfulness, as it is in Matthew 5.32. And um, secondly, in the case of willful desertion of an unbelieving spouse, when the spouse just leaves and disappears and refuses to take responsibility. In that case, God does love divorce and permits it. Now, I want to just, it's not part of the question here, but I want to make a statement here. You know, God hates divorce but he still loves the person who's gone through it. But unfortunately, we are so dogmental about God hates divorce, we tend to judge the person with the event in their lives. And that's wrong. We are being pharisaical in our faith. I want you to understand that many people in church, maybe they will be coming to us, go through a divorce for whatever reason. Whatever reason. There are so Many complicated, I mean, I've sat and listened to so many people's stories. Some of them are ridiculous. They go through it. A young man, he got married three months after the wife got, his, got her visa and went away to the U.S. What do you do? Do you tell him to sit down and say, God hates divorce, you stay in this marriage for the rest of your life? No. Seemed like she got married just to get a visa. And both were believers. What do you do in that case? You tell him God hates divorce, so don't get divorced. He had to end the marriage because she just disappeared. Three months after marriage, believers. So God hates the event, but he loves the person. Never judge a person who's been through a divorce, who's going through a divorce, extend God's love and mercy. We don't understand it, we're going to be channels of his love. 
Amen? Next Sunday, we're going to continue some questions on lifestyle. Should I wear tattoos? Is makeup okay? We'll do all those questions next Sunday. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.